someone who works outdoors all day, can they replace their daily water intake with just electrolyte beverages? Ah, great question. So this is a great question and there's a lot that'll go into it. Everyone can see me okay. Let's figure we'll get on my feet here. All righty. So water is extremely important. Electrolyte beverages are a great tool that will help to replenish what our bodies are losing when we're active throughout our days. We're constantly needing to cycle in new water, staying hydrated as much as we can throughout the day. Um, when it comes to hydration, one, one tip and trick that I try to share with people is try to have a cup of water every half hour to 45 minutes. Now that may mean a few extra trips to the bathroom, but that is exercise if you think about it. So that's the one point. Um, there are a couple of points that I'd like to touch on. Henry, if you can go to the next slide. So in summary, for people who work outside all day, it's a high demand job. You're, you're going to be sweating a lot. You're going to your body is going to be using all of its energy stores to do the job that you're going to be doing. If you know that you are going to be working outside and you're going to need that water handy, stay prepared. So what I mean by that is bring a few extra water bottles. Ideally in a perfect world, you have a re, uh, reusable water bottle. That's about, you know, two liters, depending on the job. If you can get something a little bit bigger, great. Or hopefully you have access to a place where you can constantly refill the water. So that's what I would say is, before you start your day, be prepared, have things in place that you'll be able to have your water handy um, rather than relying on some other tools. But with that being said, when it comes to electrolyte drinks, they are extremely valuable and useful. They help to replenish a lot of those micronutrients and the amino acids and electrolytes that we need to help to have our body functioning at an optimal level. So they're a great tool. One thing I will say is please try to limit the amount of sugar content that's in these electrolyte beverages. If you can find the sugar-free version, those are great. Always checking the ingredients on the back, making sure that you can pronounce what the ingredients are, trying to go for as natural as we can, or even uh, making some of your own electrolyte beverages. Flavored water is a great way to do that. Um, there's a lot of nutrients in lemons and oranges and, and cucumber waters. You can get really creative with it, especially adding some herbs to it like mint. Um, so be prepared. If you do know you're going you're gonna to be outside for eight hours of your day working on a construction site or landscaping or just outside gardening, have that water handy close to you within eyesight so you'll know to grab it every so often. And that's important. Nutrition is also super important too. Um, water is the filter. It helps to filter the body, constantly cycling through, getting rid of a bunch of byproducts that we may not need. That's where nutrition comes into. Making sure that we're putting in enough nutrients in our body so that we're able to maintain our overall functioning. And then that water and electrolytes are, are a great uh, tool to help us with that. Electrolytes are a great addition. Electrolyte beverages are a great addition to your daily life. So if you can find, like I said, low sugar, um, high nutrient versions of electrolyte beverages, they are out there. Um, find a cost point that's you know effective for you. Um, but it is, a, it is a useful addition. So at the very least, yeah, it's a great tool. But again, trying to be as prepared as you can and keeping an eye out for certain things, things like sugar and nutrition and ingredients within the electrolyte beverages. So do your research on it. Get a second opinion. I, was, I would say start there. All righty. Um, on to the next slide. <clears throat> mm. Oh, great. For someone who used the bike often at fitness centers but doesn't have access to that at home, what lower body exercises can one do at home? No. Awesome. Great question. Uh, to the next slide. Great. So you use the bike a lot at the fitness center. It was your go-to cardio equipment. This pandemic happens. You don't have access to a bike anymore or a stationary bike at home. What do you do? Great question. A few questions you need to ask yourself is what are you going to use the bike for? Is it to get promoting circulation because of lower impact? There are a lot of benefits to using bikes and um, just understanding what benefit you're getting from it is the starting point. What are your goals? Are you focusing on just overall well-being, uh, body composition, performance? Are you going to be training aerobically or anaerobically? So is it going to be longer, longer bike rides that you're looking to do? Are you looking to have more of a be useful with your time? So you want to... Um, you want your time to be a little bit, uh, used a little bit more wisely. 
Um, so things to consider. If you are looking to improve power, that's where you would get into more of the high intensity interval training, where let's say you start off with two minutes of a continuous exercise. Um, from there, you would then go into a higher bout of let's say 30 seconds of high intensity workload, bringing that down into your rest phase for about a minute. Now, what can you do at home if you don't have the equipment? Starting there in terms of what you want to achieve from it. Do you have a good amount of time on your hands or do you not? If you have the time on your hands and you want to just go for leisurely cardiovascular exercise, walks are great, something that's a lower impact. Uh, even just walking up and down the stairs at home is a great way to do it. Or if you're looking for more performance-based, that's when maybe um, doing more resistance-style training or total body boot camp-style workouts where it's in a circuit setting. So you have three to four exercises that you're going to be doing back-to-back. -back. That's another way to um, complement what you were doing on the bike in the fitness centers. Time is also a huge important, uh, pretty important too. Like I mentioned there, how much time do you have in your hands? How do you want to use that time? Um, posture, posture is super important. So the benefits to using things like a bike or some of these lower impact uh, machines is just that it's lower impact, but you also want to make sure where your posture is within that. Are we leaning forward or rounded? Are we keeping our back up nice and straight? Are we engaging various muscle groups to help us maintain our mobility and overall performance? Uh, as well as the balance of the exercises. So if you don't have a bike at home and you really want to get that cardio benefit to it, there are so many exercises that you can do to help you give that, to help you get that benefit. The point I'm trying to make here is what is your goal and how do you want to achieve it? If your goal is just to get your heart rate up, um, protect your body and help improve the strength of overall uh, the joints and whatnot, there's a lot that you can do. I would say consult with a fitness professional, or family member, there's a lot of information that Markham is putting out online now where you can find it on, um, through YouTube or, or the newsletter. So keep an eye out for that. But what I suggest that you do is taking a few key exercises, putting them together in a circuit style, where let's say you have time restraints and you only have about half an hour. You can get a really intense workout in by combining exercises back to back with limited rest time. By doing something like that, that would be more anaerobic. You're um, using a lot of your energy stores for short bursts of time and gradually in increasing that. Whereas let's say you wanted to do a 20 minute walk, came home, you did some push-ups, some squats, things like that. That'd be different in terms of the energy systems that we, that you were using. So ask yourself, why was I using the bike? What did I like about it? And in terms of what you can do at home to get that same benefit, there are so many, so many options. There's a lot of content online, like I just mentioned. Um, and again, it comes down to really, what you wanted to get from using the bike and how can we adapt now um, doing things like adding a uh, squat in with maybe some steps or jumping jacks or a lot of the classes that Cassie and some of the group fitness uh, uh, people are putting out on online as well, following along with that. Um, if you liked it because of the circulation aspects that you were getting from using the bike, don't be afraid to just practice pedaling and getting that circulation through the hips, knees and ankles and the lower back. If you were doing it because it was a little bit safer on your lower back, there are some other exercises that we touched on before that will help to uh, strengthen the lower back as well as the muscles around the lower body as well. So definitely keeping that in mind uh, and just getting creative with what you can do to supplement or, sub or supplement uh, using a bike or something else that you may have at home um, and just making sure that you stay balanced between the lower body, upper body, the front of the body, the back of the body, knowing your limitations and what you want to achieve and improve on, I would say start there. And then from there, we can help you uh, a little bit further with that. Um, next slide, please. So this was a cool question. I, I, uh, do I need to warm up before going outside to garden? Uh, if so, what are some good stretches to do? In short, yes. Gardening, it, depending, Gardening in the summertime, you're going to be doing it a lot. <clears throat> you want to make sure that you are maintaining your physical abilities to go out and garden. It takes a lot out of you, and I'm sure there are times that you're outside working on the garden for even up to a few hours. And knowing how much time you're going to be spending out there will really determine your quote-unquote warm-up. Gardening does require a lot of movement. It's very rare that you're just in one position. Yes, you may be in a squatted position working on uh, various, uh, you know, herbs or plants or vegetables or, or fruits, but you're also bouncing around, you're watering the grass. 
body position is going to be essential for, for preparing to go out and garden. If you know that it's just going to be, you know, watering the grass day, you're just going to be watering your, watering your garden, just focusing on keeping an upright posture, warming up the lower body and the upper body in the back. It may be less of an intense gardening session. So you might need to do just a little bit of exercises to warm up the body. If we are just doing that, you know, it could be as simple as just moving the legs front and back, lifting the knees up and down, out to the side, warming up the hip muscles around the body so that if you are just walking and you're not going to be crouching down or kneeling, focusing on your postural muscles, maintaining a good upright posture, engaging the core, doing a little bit of light twists, even doing some exercises where you might be on a chair, depending on your limitations, just starting off just by, you know, warming up the hips and activating some of the side glute muscles, things like that. If you do know that you might be on the ground quite a bit, that may require a little bit more stretching. If we are going to be in that crouched position, you have to understand that we're going to be working a lot of the lower body holding this position. We may or may not be rounded, so we want to make sure that we're activating the muscles through our back to help us stay upright, as well as relieve a lot of the pressure through that lower back. So if that's the case, what I would say to do is definitely increase the uh, length of your warm-up, and ways to do that would be keeping your shoulders back and down. You want to start off by activating some of the muscle groups and lengthening our torso to maintain. So one exercise you can do for that is feet together, toes touching hands on the elbows, and you can just reach up towards the ceiling and tilting over one side to the other. I would recommend doing more of a dynamic warm-up before you go out and start gardening. By that, I mean you're going to be doing stretches that you'll be moving through just to prime the muscles to get ready for a little bit more activity. And then after you garden, doing some of those held stretches where let's say for example, we wanted to stretch the quads because we know we're going to be uh, in a held squat position for a while, working on the garden, doing things like bringing the heel towards the hip, shoulders back and down, good quad stretch, and back down, or even doing a held hamstring stretch. So if we know that, like I said, we want to do more of a dynamic warm-up to start, what you can do is have that, in this case, having a heel right out in front, you go into a hamstring stretch, holding it for about three seconds or so before standing up, bringing the hip right over top of the heel and then pushing the hips back as you bend. And by doing this, what you're doing is priming the muscle to be able to lengthen and shorten, preparing it for, for exercise uh, or gardening rather. We are also going to be wanting to focus on stretching the front of the hip here. One way we can do that is take a good step forward, good step back. And once again, key things to remember when we're doing a stretch like this is we want to tilt that pelvis back, activate that, that back hip muscle, the glute, shoulders tight, and we're just going to bend that knee forward. So you want to make sure that you're not kneeling too far or arching the back. You want to stay engaged as much as you can. And we're just going to bend that knee forward, getting a bit of a pull through that top of the hip and back. So by doing more dynamic stretches at the beginning, like I said, we're priming the muscle. Right after that, depending on the length of your gardening session, you would then get into a few more held stretches too. Holding that for a little bit longer, helping to relax the muscle after that. So understanding what body position you're gonna be in. One thing I would recommend is we wanna relieve as much stress as we can on our body and the joints. So if we can avoid going into kind of a rounded position to work on the garden, let's try to do that. One way you might be able to do that, if possible, is just getting into a kneeling position keeping the back up straight. And I do understand that since we're gonna be working out in the garden for a while, that may get a little bit more fatigue. So trying your best just to be conscious of your body, maintaining good posture as best as you can. And even in between um, some of your gardening, you also do some stretching in between. Let's say you've been kneeling in that position for a while. Take a second to stand up, place two hands behind your back and just bring yourself into extension. Usually with gardening, we're in a bit of a flexed position. And so if you can help by bringing your body out of that flexed position into more of an extension, that'll be a great thing to do as well. So stretching before, during, and after is super important. There are a ton of exercises that I can go through uh, when we have a little bit more time. 
But again, key things to remember is more dynamic stretching at the beginning where you're just getting some of that circulation to the, to the lower body and upper body, getting into a little bit of torso rotation, doing a little bit more of that dynamic stretching in between uh, gardening, and then right after holding these stretches for a little bit longer, just helping to relax the muscles of the body there. Um, like I said, for more stretching and specifically to gardening, I can definitely take a little bit more time to, to show you what those stretches would be like. But in terms of what muscles to stretch, definitely want to stretch the front of the lower legs, or excuse me, the front of the legs, the sides of the legs, the back of the legs, the hips, a little bit of the torso, and definitely the shoulders. So doing things like rolling the shoulders, getting them ready for a lot of rounding, and even some neck stretches right afterwards. Okay. Um, I hope that helps to answer a lot of these questions. I could spend a lot of time on this stuff, breaking down each exercise, but let's save that for another day or reach out to one of the Markham staff or follow on the, um, on the YouTube page. Um, Henry, do you have any questions at all from anyone? Not yet. Um, so I'll open up the floor. Um, what I will do soon, too, since we are still recording, I'll even take some time to show a few other stretches that people can do. So before going out to garden, like I was saying, if we're focusing on doing a few stretches to isolate the hip and the lower body, one exercise we can do is we want to open up those hips so that we can be able to get down into a lower position. So what we're going to do to start is we're going to have one leg straight out in front, we're going to cross the opposite leg right over top of the knee to your best of the ability to the best of your abilities. If you only cross it just below the knee, that's fine. Working up as high as you can. And now from here to make it more dynamic, we're just going to tilt forward, holding that for a few seconds and then tilting back. So we're practicing on lengthening the muscle as well as shortening it back into the position, getting ready for constantly lengthening and shortening the muscles throughout. Another one we can do is for the torso, and these are seated exercises, so we can do some seated and some standing. I'll show you both. Backs up tall, you would just bring your hand across your body, resting on your knee. Opposite hand is going to be on the chair. We're just going to rotate our upper body to that side and alternating as we go. So not really holding it for too long, but slow controlled movements as we go through. I showed you one hamstring stretch that you can do uh, standing. Another one is, is seated as well, keeping that heel on the ground, back up nice and straight as we hinge our upper body forward, holding that for about three to five seconds before leaning back, hinging forward, holding that for three to five seconds, and back. A little bit more for the hips, because the front of the hips are very important. So I showed you a quad stretch that everybody's probably very familiar with, keeping the hand on a wall or a chair. But one thing I'd like everyone to focus on here is making sure that the knees don't separate too far apart, bringing those heels together. If you are limited in your range of motion, that's fine too. We'll work within it. And then what you can do is just using the chair just to bring that leg up. And maybe you'll feel the stretch, pushing those hips forward, keeping those shoulders back, getting a bit more lengthening through the front of the thigh here and back. So we're gonna be focusing on hinging through the hip, pushing the hips forward back, forward, and back. And now, just a couple for the torso that could be very useful and easy enough to do standing, and hopefully a lot of people can do this one, is uh, one of my personal favorites. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our left foot forward, right foot back, shoulders back and down, tummies tight. All you would do here is having your left arm nice and straight, palms facing in, and you would just reach your arm up towards the ceiling, rotating your upper body, to that left side as you bring that arm all the way around. So we're gonna have that left foot forward, right foot back and down, tucking that pelvis, squeezing our hips nice and tight, staying engaged. And this is another great dynamic stretch that we're gonna be doing. Left arm straight, palm facing in, reaching up, rotating to that left side as you bring it all the way back around. Now, depending on if you may have some shoulder pain, you may stop a little at, at a certain point before bending the elbow back and around, working within your your range of motion and your abilities, and then doing things like shoulder arm raises and shoulder rolls are another great way to warm the shoulders, getting ready for, for some gardening. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions? Any questions at all? That's some uh, great uh, examples, John. Um, do you have anything specifically for anyone with osteoporosis? 
Yep. Um, so with osteoporosis, you want to make sure that you're limiting higher impact. So it would be a focus on maybe doing things seated, like some of the exercises that we, we showed seated. It could even be as simple as getting that circulation going to various joints. So osteoporosis is usually around some of the more uh, weight bearing joints, so hips, knees, and ankles. What I would say to do is holding onto the wall or a chair, it might just be as something as simple as getting the ankles rolling. Rolling ankles going one way, ankles rolling the other way. And it would just be a matter of maybe doing some knee lifts, knee raises, getting that circulation to these joints. Now, it's not necessarily a stretch. It may just be an active warm up, just creating that circulation to our various joints, bringing the leg out towards the side and across, controlling that movement through the muscle. And again, so if we're doing something like bringing the leg out towards the side, you just keep that leg straight as you pull it out towards one side, holding it for a second, and then over and across. Uh, for osteoporosis, you wanna make sure that you're not doing anything too quick or too rapid with too much uh, power or force. Slow it down, take your control of it. And again, doing things like just shoulder rolls, looking to the left and to the right, looking down and up for the neck, pulling your shoulders back and down, reaching up towards the ceiling there and back down. And then again, um, just again to promote circulation to those joints so that as you start moving a little bit more and getting into some, some more of the trickier positions, the body is prepared and ready for um, more of what you're going to be doing relating to gardening. I know that there, there are so many exercises that we can do um, and it's all specific to each person. Uh, so pertaining to osteoporosis, definitely want to slow things down. Not a lot of impact on the joints. Even if it's as simple as doing a few squats before you get started, focusing on slow and controlled movements as you bend the knees and coming back up. Even if it's just a matter of activating the muscles that are around the areas that we're going to be working. Maybe you just practice on standing, squeezing the hips nice and tight, straightening the legs, squeezing the quads, the sides of the muscles, the back, tummies tight, and then relaxing here. Um, so definitely you want to practice moving the body before going into um, some of the gardening or any activity for that matter. Um, Great suggestion. And, maybe, and then maybe uh, another one of our webinars we can um, touch on a little bit more if here are some exercises to do um, or some stretches to do uh, both before, during, and after some type of exercise or activity. Um, so I, I wanted to touch on that a little bit today. So there were a few exercises and stretches that I went over, um, but there are so many and uh, it's just all very specific to the person. And again, reaching out to myself or any other, other fitness staff uh, or Markham staff about getting some, some more clarity on that. Alrighty. If there are no other questions, um, are there any other questions I'd be happy to answer? Uh, none, none right now, but uh, please share this with your friends and family members. If they have any questions or topics uh, they want us to touch on, please email groupfitness at markham.ca. I'm going to type it in the chat just so you can have it. Oops. Again, it's groupfitness at markham.ca. Thanks, Henry. And I, one big takeaway from the questions uh, that were, were asked uh, that you submitted is it's all very specific to you. And finding what works best for you and your body is really the takeaway that I'm trying to share. Uh, I could take the time to really break down and show you a lot of different exercises that we could be doing. The question relating to osteoporosis, um, you want to decrease the impact, but still have enough stress on the muscle rather than the joint to help to strengthen the muscle, relieving that pressure on the joint, in turn, uh, improving overall mobility. Um, for the person working outside, making sure that you're prepared 
having good balanced meals ready, high in nutrients, because it is going to be physically demanding on the body, having those electrolyte drinks to complement the water, not substitute, making sure that they are the healthiest version that you can find, low sugar, um, is always a great way to go about it. Um, oh, Joe, we have a question here. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the best way to squat when you pick up items uh, to avoid back injury? And uh, do those back support belts help? Mm -hmm. Great question. Do the back support uh, belts help? They're a useful tool, but I personally believe that nothing is more useful than training your muscles and training your body to not necessarily rely on that. It's a great tool and definitely valuable when you're doing tasks for a longer period of time, um, making sure that we um, help to build the endurance and the strength through the lower back, but also the muscles that go around the hip that, you know, work alongside a lot of our, our back muscles that um, essentially training your body to do the work of a, an assistive belt, uh, not necessarily rely on it, uh, relying on it, but it's there as a, as a tool for when we, uh, when we need it. When it comes to lifting something up, I'd be lying if I, I said I never saw anybody do, you know, there's something on the ground and you just kind of reach and you want to get it up as fast as you can. Um, try to slow everything down. If you have to pick something up, it doesn't have to be done quickly. Take your time to say, okay, I'm going to be a little bit more aware of my body movement. So what's the safest way to pick something up from the ground? It starts with the relationship between the hips and the legs, hips and the knees. So we want to focus on unlocking the hips as we then bend the knees. So the first part of the movement, let's say we're picking something up. First thing I would say is get as close to you as, as you can to that object. I want to have it nice and close by so that we're not reaching too far for it. So I would say if you can, standing right over top of it or again, as close as you can. As we lower, you don't want to just drop down as fast as you can. Take your time to slowly control that descent, pushing those hips back as we bend the knees. So again, it's the relationship between the hips and the knees, pushing the hips back as you bend the knees, keeping a good upright posture, keeping your torso engaged, activating some of the glute muscles. Um, more specifically, if you are able to tilt your pelvis, keeping your shoulders back and down, just really maintaining an upright posture. But for the sake of today, the relationship between the hips and the knees, pushing the hips back as you bend the knees, coming down as low as we can. And then from there, Grabbing it with both hands, keeping the back up straight, squeezing our hip muscles, squeezing our bums nice and tight, pushing our feet down into the floor, a good upright posture as we stand. Rather than, let me just pick this up or let me just bend over and grab it. It may not, there may not be an injury the first time you lift something like that, but over time, you want to make sure that you're practicing proper lifting techniques and healthy lifting techniques so that you decrease the risk of injury and limit that overall. So that's, that's one way to lift something up a little bit more safely. Um, if it's something awkward to pick up, ask for help or a friend. If you don't feel comfortable lifting something up like that, try to, try to avoid it if you can. If it's absolutely necessary, the other thing you can do is get objects or tools that could be helpful to you. If you're able to, let's say, start by getting this object up to a certain point, maybe a chair or a bench so that it's a little bit higher, great. Maybe you start there. And then from here, if you needed to move it a little bit higher, you're not squatting as low. You're not getting as low to the ground before you move it or put it somewhere else. Um, so practice the relationship between the hips, knees, and ankles, but also making sure that we maintain a good upright posture through the movements. All right, John. Uh, if I have pain in my shins from overuse, what's the best way to relieve the pain? Is there a, is there a stretch I can do? Yes. Uh, so shin splints are very common, um, <clears throat> especially from higher impact activities like running or jogging or like running or jogging or, or playing sports or um, overuse injuries like uh, riding a bike spill the wrong way or uh, maybe some imbalances in the lower body. So what we can do are just a few stretches. I would say stretching the calf is always a great way to do it. So if you have a wall handy, what you can do is just bringing your 
toes up towards the up against the wall, put, bringing the bottom of the foot up against the wall, keeping your shoulders back and down, and then just pushing the hips forward, just so you're bringing the hips forward and in front of that ankle and heel, just until you feel a bit of a calf stretch through there. If you are feeling a little bit more of uh, discomfort through the front of the shin, you would just do the opposite movement. So holding, keeping our balance up against the wall here, what we can do is point the toes back and just bending our knees, letting our body weight apply a little bit of pressure just to the front of that lower body, just to relieve a little bit of pressure, focusing on the stretch to the front of the lower shin, pushing the hips back as we bend the knees. And back up. The other thing I would recommend to do is definitely focusing on stretching all the muscles in the lower body, not just the calves. For example, it could be the hamstrings that are a little bit too tight. That's pulling up on the calf muscles, which could be leading to that imbalance where you're feeling it mostly in the front of the, the front of the lower uh, shin. Practicing doing some exercises that will help to improve your balance and stability and strength through the arch of the foot. So in short, definitely doing some basic calf stretches. If you do have a stair or steps at home, just hanging on to your railings with your toes on the stairs as you drop your heels down towards the ground, keeping your legs straight. So stretching the back of the calf, front of the leg here as well. And even doing things just like toe raises up towards the ceiling, big round circles at the ankles. And again, not neglecting all the other muscles around the legs. And you may start, it may be a symptom at the lower leg, but it could be the issue at the top of the hip, making sure that you're stretching and activating other things around there to help relieve that pressure. Um, so definitely an easy calf stretch, like, like I said, coming up against the wall, having our heel on the ground, toes pointing up, bottom of the foot's up against the wall as best as we can. And the goal here is to just bring the hips forward and on top of the ankle, and then doing the opposite movement where we push our toes down, putting the, pushing the top of the foot down into the floor, keeping the shoulders back and down. And then doing things like, you know, foam rolling for the front of the leg. There are a lot of other things that you can do, but I would say starting, starting simple and applying heat and ice is always a good thing too. So I'll apply um, ice to the joints and then heat to the muscle, just again, to help promote circulation both before, during, uh, both before and after some of these stretches as well. Thanks, John. Sure. All right, I think those are all the questions we have for today. Awesome. Well, again, everybody, thank you for tuning in and watching. Um, there's so many answers to the questions that you're putting up, and I try to share the most relevant information as I can for the questions that you ask. Again, like I said, if you do have any follow-up questions uh, regarding this, feel free to reach out to Markham or myself. I'll be happy to answer them for you at any time. There's a lot of content and information that Markham is putting out, so keep, keep an eye out for that. Um, and again, write some of these questions down, submit them. Um, if there's something a little bit more specific that you're hoping to gain knowledge on, submit them and we'll try to address that at our uh, next luncheon. And uh, you would submit them to uh, groupfitness at markham.ca. Awesome. All right, thanks, John. Thanks for watching everyone, I appreciate your time. Yeah, we'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye.